Thanks, Matt. Yes, I uh, also help organize that applied machine learning conference in Charlottesville that we've heard a few shout outs for uh, so far today. So I'll be talking today about creating a next generation financial data set from scratch with NLP and active learning. So as, uh, as Matt mentioned, my name is Patrick Harrison. I work at a company called S&P. I serve as the director of AI engineering there. And our group is a group of data scientists and machine learning engineers who are working to build production AI powered applications in the company. In this talk, we're going to start off by talking a little bit about S&P to give you some background on, uh, on the company and the kind of problems that we think about. I'll talk about a major structural trend in financial data today, which is something called ESG. We'll talk about creating an ESG data set from scratch using some of the tools that we all know and love, like Spacey, BERT, and also some active learning. And at the end, I will persuade you that S&P Global is a great place for S&P practitioners, if you aren't already uh, well aware. So talking about the company a little bit, S&P Global, you're already familiar with it, even if you, it doesn't come top of mind. It's a financial data and technology company. You may have heard of some of our divisions, like the, uh, the ratings agency. So whenever you hear about countries or companies getting their credit rating upgraded or downgraded, that's one of our divisions. If you've heard of the Dow Jones or the S&P 500 stock indices in the States, or maybe the S&P Europe 350, uh, that's also S&P through our indices division. There's also the market intelligence division, which is our general purpose data analytics research and news arm. And there's also a division called Platts that focuses on energy analytics. And we're a pretty big and well-established company. We're a member of the Fortune 500, 50 plus billion in market cap. Uh, so we've been around for a while. We'll probably be around for, uh, for a while still. So talking about our customers, customers will typically subscribe to our data and information services. And they might include companies who are learning, looking to learn more about the markets that they operate in and their competitors. There might be banks or investors that are looking to lend money to or invest money in those companies. It might be governments or policymakers who are looking to regulate or make policy in the industries that some of these companies are operating in. It might be professional services like law firms or consulting firms that are helping out these companies. Or it might be academic researchers who are studying all of this. <laughs> and all of these customers have one thing in common, one problem that they're trying to solve which is that they need to make the best possible decisions for the future of their organizations. And these are some of the largest institutions in the world. So the decisions that are being made in these organizations are, are a really big deal. So we can rephrase that question, I, I need to make better decisions, as I need data. And this is where S&P can help. Relevant, accurate data makes better decisions possible. And for our customer base, when our customers make better decisions, it can lead to economic growth and better governance. Some of the data sets that we're talking about here, I, um, it took me a, a little while. I didn't even know which ones to talk about because there's so many and I only have time to mention a few. So uh, some cross-industry data sets that we have. Uh, of course, we've got conventional financial performance metrics for 99 plus percent of the companies in the world. We've got news and events about these companies. Uh, we've got professionals, which is the people involved in these companies. So all the board members, top executives, uh, leaders at these companies, we've got their, their bios and backgrounds and their, their professional histories. And uh, interesting for an NLP audience, we're the main provider of conference call transcripts. So every quarter companies, uh, at least in the, the US, it works this way, companies hold a conference call with investors to announce their results. We're listening in and transcribing that live and tagging that data with uh, a bunch of interesting metadata like who's speaking and what are they saying. Uh, and there's some interesting work you can do to correlate that with other financial performance metrics. And there's many more of these. And I also wanted to pick out a, an industry specific data set and we've got tons of these too so pick a particular industry and there will be an analogy here but the one that I chose was uh, for North America we've got the data on the entire natural gas pipeline network and the operations of that network so all the natural gas flowing through the North American natural gas pipeline network volumes over time you can get that kind of data from us and pick whatever industry you like media or um, real estate and we'll have analo analogous data sets that, uh, that go deep. I wanted to talk a bit about the operating model of the, the company to ground the rest of the conversation here. So at, uh, at S&P, 
the, at the lowest level, we're tapping into external data sources. So these will typically be things like company documents that they file with government regulators or press releases that they just publish on their website. Um, these might be the company websites themselves. They might be news from third parties about the companies or, or third party data feeds. Uh, this slide is really meant to demonstrate that there are lots of these external data sources and they're really disaggregated. And we have what I call the, the data engine of S&P Global, and the job of the data engine is to tap into all of these external data sources and try to collect, clean, and standardize the, these data into uh, our standardized data sets. So these are some of the data sets that we just talked about on the, the last slide. So creating gold standard data sets out of all of the information flowing through these external data sources. On top of the standardized data sets, we've got common delivery channels. So we've got a web platform, a plugin for Office for Excel analysts. You can dump our data straight into Microsoft Excel. Or more of interest to data scientists and developers, you can get data feeds from us for bulk data access, or you can use APIs. And on top of that, I, I think about our different divisions as different storefronts that package these standard data sets and delivery channels into different types of products that our customers can buy and interact with. And then on top of that, finally, we've got our customers. And as the arrows on the sides indicate here, we've got the flow of information going from bottom to top, from those external disaggregated information sources all the way up to our customers with increasing value at, uh, at each step in the, the company's value chain on the way. Uh, oh, yeah, and this is my group, the AI engineering group. We live in that data engine layer. So our, our job is to really take AI methodologies and emerging technologies and apply, this, apply them to this core problem of getting the data from wherever it exists in the world and trying to aggregate, clean, standardize this data into the best data set for X, whatever the, uh, the standardized data set in question is. Another really interesting piece of background information about S&P Global is our accuracy guarantee. And to a, an audience of NLP practitioners, I might refer to this as the 100% uh, precision, 100% recall rule. If there is a fact in the public domain and it falls within the scope of S&P Global's information coverage, we will typically guarantee that that fact will be in our data sets and that the data will be correct. And if you find an example where the data is missing or incorrect, we will send you $50. <laughs> so uh, this is a, a part of our life at S&P Global as, uh, as folks who live in that, that data engine. So the, the customers that rely on us and the decisions that they're trying to make, anything less than 100% complete and correct data is just unacceptable. And uh, yeah, the decisions that they're making are just uh, you know, too big. So, so this, uh, this is really puts, puts engineering groups and NLP practitioners in particular in an interesting position because it really forces you to think through how do our models and the work that we're doing fit in the context of a larger system that can get to what you might call eventual 100% accuracy. Um, nobody's going to be excited about your 88% model F1 score if it's not in the context of a larger system that can get to 100%. So let's talk about ESG data, this, uh, this acronym that I've been mentioning here. This represents a, a structural trend and a change over the last five years or so in the financial data markets. In the past, when somebody was trying to do research on a company, the conventional financial performance metrics, things like your net income, your total assets, these were the gold standard, these were really paramount. And today, over the, the last five years or so, and increasing in volume, customers are clamoring for new types of information about the, the companies that, they, uh, that they're trying to research. And it's not that, that fundamental uh, financial metrics are no longer important, but they're just not the be all end all of what our customers are looking for. And in particular, customers are asking for ESG data. And what this means is environmental, social, or governance. That's the acronym. And this is information about companies' environmental, social, and governance practices. Uh, their practices with respect to climate change or workplace safety or the structure of their board of directors, things like that. Uh, 
And I can give you some, some more concrete examples of ESG attributes. So one is, uh, I'll just go through a, a list here. So uh, has this company made a public commitment to reduce or eliminate deforestation in their operations? Uh, does the company disclose anything that it's doing to promote sustainable water use in its business operations? Uh, do they prohibit child labor practices in their business operations or in their supply chain? Has this company made a public commitment regarding animal welfare practices? This is an interesting one. Is the CEO's compensation linked to company performance on sustainability metrics? Does the company have targets in place for diversity and inclusion in its workforce? And there, there are hundreds more of these. You can just imagine tons of metrics that you might be interested about, about companies' environmental, social, or governance practices, and investors and banks and regulators definitely are. So this data is really hard to get today. And we want to help solve that problem for our customers by creating the best ESG data set in the world. So another standardized data set block in that business model that we were talking about before. And the problem is that collecting standardized ESG data across thousands of companies is really hard and potentially harder than conventional financial performance metrics. So talking about that, digging in there a little bit, conventional data is typically regulated and ESG data is typically not, at least not yet. Uh, disclosure is mandatory for conventional data. In ESG data, non-disclosure is common. Companies report similar metrics for uh, conventional data. ESG data, companies report a variety of metrics or no metrics at all. Uh, reports come in standard formats. In ESG data, re uh, companies report data in various formats and channels. And reports will come at predictable times, like once a quarter for standard financial metrics. And in ESG data, companies may report this kind of information whenever they like, on their schedule or no schedule at all. And making this a little bit more concrete, this is what conventional financial data might, uh, might look like and where it might come from. So it might come from a document that looks like this, pretty, uh, pretty structured. Don't want to minimize the difficulty of working with these documents but, uh, because they can be pretty gnarly. But, uh, but it's fairly predictable what's going to be in here and how it's going to look. And for ESG data, by contrast, they might come in the form of reports. These are from different companies that just look like whatever the company wants and can report whatever metrics the company wants. Uh, or it might just be a one-page infographic on their website that's got all of these different blocks of different, uh, different ESG attributes. So uh, we, to, to make this even more concrete and get more specific here, we might have one ESG metric like, does the company assess risks related to water at least once a year? And we might find somewhere in one of those documents or on their website a passage that looks like this with the highlighted blue section. And we would refer to this sentence right here, uh, regular water risk index assessments to identify and understand the most significant water challenges, et cetera. This would be evidence for this ESG attribute for this company. So to summarize the task here, we need to identify spans of text that contain the relevant evidence for a company for their ESG attributes, which may or may not be disclosed anywhere. This has to be done for hundreds of ESG attributes per company across a variety of document or web channels. And this needs to be done across a thousand companies or thousands of companies. And eventual system accuracy has to be 100%. So uh, we're going to create an ESG data set from scratch with some of the tools that we know and love, Spacey, BERT, and Active Learning. So we will take a, uh, a look at an NLP modeling pipeline here. It's not going to be terribly surprising to, uh, to folks in the room what this looks like. But we'll start with documents, which are some of these PDFs or company websites that uh, we've been talking about. We'll do some sentence segmentation here, so we're going to operate at the sentence level. Uh, Spacey is super helpful for this kind of text pre-processing and uh, sentence tokenization. We, uh, we've framed this as a multi-label classification problem because the same sentence or span of text might be evidence for more than one ESG attribute or no ESG attributes at all. And we have uh, domain experts on staff who will help us with assigning multiple labels to this data. Next, we'll either train or fine-tune uh, multi-label classifiers. So right now we're exploring uh, two types of models. Uh, we're working with Spacey TextCat, which is, uh, we actually get really pretty good performance out of TextCat, and it, there's a really low barrier of entry to just get started. Uh, so sometimes this is good enough to just use, and at least it offers a really good strong baseline to see if you can improve upon it with more sophisticated techniques. And we're also working with BERT and PyTorch uh, to try to squeeze out maximal performance. 
And then, uh, of course, you can measure the performance of your models and see how you're doing. And we need to do this uh, for a really, really large, uh, potentially hundreds of class, multi-class, multi-label classification problem. At least that's how we framed it. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about the active learning uh, I, I, keep think, I keep looking at this and thinking it says active learning lifestyle, but it's active learning life cycle. Um, maybe it's a lifestyle too. So we start, if we have a new ESG attribute that we're trying to extend our models to incorporate uh, to be able to, to help with this attribute, we'll start with a few documents and some domain experts and we'll get them to provide a handful of initial annotations. This is, is pretty low barrier to entry. It might be you know, order of 10 annotations that we're looking for here. And that will populate our initial training data set. And first, we'll uh, either train or fine tune an existing model. And then we'll take that model and we will apply or run historical documents through that model using the NLP pipeline that we were just talking about. And we'll use that to make predictions. And next, we will send those predictions back to our domain experts to validate. So now we'll have a bunch of candidate text spans that might be ESG evidence, evidence for ESG attributes on the, um, out of the historical documents. And the domain experts will validate these for us. And then we can measure the performance of our model to see how we're doing on a new ESG attribute. And maybe since this is the very first time that we've tried and we only had a few training examples to train or fine tune, the performance is not good. But we can also use those validated predictions as new training data. So this generates training data that feeds back into the set which then you can run along the cycle again. And you can run through this cycle potentially many of times, uh, continuing to evaluate your model and generate new training data along the way. So uh, again, we can train a model with more training data, we can make predictions, we can validate those with our domain experts, and maybe this time when we uh, measure model performance, we've hit a threshold where we think that this model is good enough that it would accelerate a domain expert analyst uh, workflow in production at which point we flip over from model development mode into production operations mode. We'll deploy our model into a, a production operations pipeline and workflow. And this looks almost like an unfurled version of the, the active learning loop that we have here, except now we have new documents that are flowing in all the time. We're running them through our same NLP pipeline and model, making predictions, sending those to our domain experts. And the only difference now is ultimately the, uh, the validated data from those domain experts is flowing into our published data sets that go out to our clients. And uh, along the way, we can continue to be generating new training data from this production operations pipeline as well which uh, can go back into this continual model development loop. So, uh, so we would continue to train and fine tune our models as well as do research and development into new types of models and new modeling architectures to improve performance over time. Uh, yeah, so there's a, a look at the, the whole model development and production operations lifecycle. So next steps here, uh, this modeling approach and workflow, it's currently in internal production as S&P builds out its ESG data sets. Uh, we need to get up to, uh, we've got a target of thousands of companies before uh, we release this data set, so we're, we're working on that. <laughs> and members of our AI engineering group, we, we build and maintain the models and workflow tools and infrastructure that, that make this, this whole life cycle possible in conjunction with other engineering groups at S&P. So if I haven't convinced you already, I'm going to now persuade you that S&P is a great place for NLP practitioners to be uh, in my last 80 seconds or so. So uh, first thing I wanted to point out is our corpus. So we've got, uh, we work with hundreds of millions of professionally produced documents. And this is enough text data to do some really interesting things like create your own custom word vector embedding models or pre-trained language models for the financial services domain. Uh, the people that we work with, we have large teams of analysts and subject matter experts on staff who can assist with creating labeled data for us. So no more going to Mechanical Turk and getting uh, low quality data there. And we also have a data first mindset as a whole company because we are a data company that's been around for, for decades and decades. So we've got a lot of people who have been thinking really hard about storage management, quality assurance of data, and, uh, and as data scientists and NLP practitioners, we can benefit from that. Uh, so I wanted to talk about the data a little bit, and this is one specific data set that we have. So a client might come to us and ask a question like this for, uh, and, and they're just looking to the answer for this question. And we, we have this data. Uh, it might be on our website in a table that looks like that, and the answer is right there. 
And then they might come back to us and say, where did you find that? And if you notice this, uh, this table, all the numbers in there are hyperlinks. And in order to answer this question, uh, we have been labeling data like this back in context in the original document. You can click on that hyperlink and it will pop up with uh, the original data point highlighted in context. Uh, and we've been doing this for years and years, way longer than, uh, than the companies had NLP practitioners who might build models off of this data. So we've got, we've got a lot of this. We call it uh, source tagging, this feature. And I, I think that we've got some really, uh, uh, really top-notch data sets for information extraction and question answering problems in the financial services domain that we're really just getting started with uh, tapping into. Uh, and finally, talking about the impact. Uh, so processing text, it's fundamental to our core business operations. So the business opportunity for NLP, it's, it's not fuzzy. It's really direct and large for our company. And uh, lots of internal and external customers really care about the work that you produce here. So wrapping up, uh, one, one point in, uh, in our world is that it's not always the best performing model that wins. Uh, again, nobody, nobody really cares if your model is 91% accurate versus an 87% accurate model. Uh, it's an end-to-end -end system that provides business value in a specific context, uh, including potentially tightly looped human-machine collaboration. Also, we're hiring, <laughs> and I, I wanted to offer a big thank you to the folks at Explosion and the rest of the Python data science ecosystem for the incredible service and value they provide to our community. And uh, that's, that's me if you want to get in touch, so thank you.